Hello there guys, this is Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space and today we're going to be talking about a book of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Silver Chair. This is one of the later books in the series. We're just going to do a little review of it because my Short Classics for Charity book club just met about it and it was such a great discussion. I really wanted to bring some of their thoughts to you guys and let's just jump into it. So first of all, The Silver Chair is about two children who find their way into a magic land called Narnia. And they actually find that they've been called into Narnia purposefully by the ruler of Narnia, who is a lion called Aslan. And actually, he called them there because he wanted them to go on a quest for him to find the missing crown prince of the land of Narnia. They end up going on a quest and meeting all sorts of creatures from like mythology and from C.S. Lewis's imagination. It's just really a wonderful world. It's one of the later books out of seven Chronicles of Narnia. There's several different orders that you could read the books in, so I won't get into that. There's like the chronological order, there's the order they were written in, there's the order that they're published in. To my awareness, it doesn't really matter where you start, you're gonna enjoy it no matter what. But this book actually features a character who was in the book, The Dawn Treader, which features characters who were in a previous book. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So really, it's a fantasy world, but Lewis was very strong about making known that this is not an allegory because it's often described as an allegory. And I think it's very difficult to really tell a difference between an allegory and what this is sometimes because I think we're not very familiar with allegory, or at least I'm not, and that's because it's not a very popular genre anymore. But C.S. Lewis knew all about allegory. He was a scholar in Oxford, and he wrote a book about what allegory is, so he was like very firm in saying this is not an allegory. You know, it's not like Pilgrim's Progress, and indeed, if you read Pilgrim's Progress, which I've read some of, uh, it's not really anything like that, because Narnia really it's its own thing. It's a, it's a fantasy world. He calls it a supposing. He really felt that the mythology of Narnia basically prepares kids for the real world and for potentially becoming Christians in the future. Now, if you're not a Christian, please don't let that scare you. It can really just be read as an adventure series, which is, I know like how Neil Gaiman read it. He said he devoured these as a kid and just loved them. And for them, They'd come to meet me because it would be like me, age 21, getting to meet C.S. Lewis. Asked my parents to get me the whole set, which was my seventh birthday present. And I spent my seventh birthday lying on my bed and reading those books for the first of what was going to be hundreds of times. And there's a reason for that. It's because they're very whimsical, but they're kind of realistic at times. Like for example, the two children in the story fight all throughout the book and against the adults in the book, they are not always even tempered. They can be kind of sour tempered and they run across all kinds of issues in their quest to find the prince. Aslan has given them some signs to recognize in the world as they're traveling throughout Narnia to try and find the prince. He's given them some signs. That it's almost like, you know, whenever there's a prophecy at the beginning of a fantasy book and you're supposed to pay attention to the prophecy so you can try and interpret events around you and act accordingly so that the outcome that you want is the outcome that happens. They run into predictably lots of the difficulties that come with that. They have an antagonist and they get ridiculed for their beliefs and like there's all kinds of things, problems that they run into, but the biggest problem they run into is honestly their own apathy and forgetfulness. And isn't that like just so relatable? We really want to be this kind of person that we idealize in our minds as who we who we really want to be um, but then we get lazy and you know the New Year's resolutions don't end up happening you know that kind of thing you can just really enjoy it for the mythology present and the world building present and the stories present because they do feel very magical but there's also if you're a Christian and if your kids are around the age where they can be thinking about these things it can be a really good way to explore the faith imaginatively but as as a child in my book club meeting mentioned it's really annoying when adults stop and point out you see what he's saying there you see what he's doing there the child in the book club said that's really annoying please don't do that adults and that that's the time for adults to be quiet so i'm not going to get into a whole lot of that here because i think if you're reading the book 
you'll be able to recognize those moments and try to resist <laughs> pointing them out to your kids. Of course, it's always great to have discussion about books, but you know, leave it to them to kind of enjoy the story and let the metaphorical elements kind of do their work. I think C.S. Lewis wrote this with children in mind, but also he loved fairy tales, which is what the Chronicles of Narnia are, they're fairy tales. He was a big fan of fairy tales, so they're also for adults. Adults could enjoy fairy tales in middle grade as well. By the way, I am doing this review and I chose this book for my book club because of middle grade March. Thank you so much to the uh, hosts of Middle Grade March. I really just love them all, so definitely go follow them if you've never heard of Middle Grade March. It's a very special group, and every March it comes around and it just injects so much life into BookTube. Everybody gets excited about it and it's fun. Yeah, that was exciting. I also read a great article, bringing it back to the allegory thing, from Tor.com, and I will link that down below. It'll have to be like a truncated link because uh, YouTube is not very link friendly in the description. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's a really wonderful article called Neither Allegory Nor Lion, Aslan and the Chronicles of Narnia. Highly recommend checking that out if you're curious what Aslan and Chronicles of Narnia meant to C.S. Lewis as the author. Like I said, it's a kind of a mythology to prepare children and C.S. Lewis wrote it that way because he actually became a Christian through mythology. He was an atheist and he was not writing all of these books, like I said, as an allegory, they just were an outgrowth of his brain because he was very steeped in scripture. You can just really tell when you're reading this, so it's kind of a treat if you're familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. And as is typical, the Old Testament scriptures, if you're very familiar with them, every part of literature is going to be enriched for you, and it's, it's really a treat. And it's kind of like learning a new language. If you're familiar with a language, you can really enjoy things in that other language. And if you're not, it's just not gonna be the same for you. But it, regardless, I think the Chronicles of Narnia really stand on their own as stories and a world all on its own. So there was this great quote I thought about centaurs. C.S. Lewis includes, there's river gods and goddesses, there's magic, and there's, there's centaurs, there's giants, there's like all kinds of beings from mythology throughout the series, which is what makes it really fun, in my opinion. So I thought I would just share a quick quote, actually it's not a quick quote, but a quote about the mythology in Narnia to kind of give you guys an idea of what it's like. The centaurs were very polite in a grave, gracious, grown-up kind of way, and as they cantered through the Narnian woods, they spoke without turning their heads, telling the children about the properties of herbs and roots, the influences of the planets, the nine names of Aslan with their meaning, with their meanings, and things of that sort. But however sore and jolted the two humans were, they would now give anything to have that journey over again, to see those glades and slopes sparkling with last night's snow, to be met by rabbits and squirrels and birds that wished you good morning, to breathe again the air of Narnia and hear the voices of the Narnian trees. Animals, there are talking animals. I don't know that I've really read a lot of books with talking animals that I enjoyed. I've tried a couple that just, they just weren't really my thing. Um, although I did love Watership Down. That was great. So regardless of the genre of the work, there are some themes that are very applicable to like Christian life and Christian living. So persistence and arming yourself and your faith were very important for these kids, as I said. And also how can evil exist? It's due to the preservation of choice. And yet God can still be good and sovereign. That's a line that's, it's not walked finely. It's just like, it's shown. He just, his stories really show how evil can exist. Evil exists in Narnia because of what humans have chosen. Originally in The Magician's Nephew, which is a prequel to all these books that was published, I think, second to last, before the last battle, The Magician's Nephew talks about how the first white witch came into Narnia. In The Silver Chair, we're dealing with another wicked witch of the same race or a fellow wicked witch. And throughout the ages of Narnia, these witches are causing trouble and they're there because a human made a decision that allowed the witch into this world. So um, it talks about how really human choice is what allows so much evil into the perfect world that was created to be a certain way and then humans messed it up as we do. And yet you still see Aslan being a force for good and he is sovereign, he's all-knowing, and yet he lets people and Narnians participate 
in how the world works because that's a privilege for us. Because he loves humans and wants to involve them in everything and let them experience Narnia and enrich Narnia. It's a really good discussion point. Why does Aslan allow the witches into these worlds? That's something we talked about in the book club and it was a really great discussion. And of course, my very favorite thing about this book is the character of Puddleglum. He is what stayed in my mind ever since I was a kid. This was my first time rereading this book as an adult. I definitely read it when I was a kid. I just remembered the character of Puddleglum who is a marsh wiggle and he is as doleful as a funeral and yet perfectly happy. And although he talks as if he is afraid of everything, yet he is really as brave as a lion. <laughs> so if you are at all curious about Narnia or this book or the series, The Chronicles of Narnia, definitely read it for Puddleglum. Like he is worth it. He's so quotable and so rich as a character. He definitely was why I was obsessed with this world in addition to all the great world building that just enriched it so much. I give the Silver Cherry 85 out of 100% really obviously very much loved it. And that's a totally honest review as an adult, not accounting for all the nostalgia that I had um, from reading this in childhood. So it was a really great one. And yeah, that's it. If you're looking for a place to start with the Chronicles of Narnia, um, I would say probably start with The Magician's Nephew or The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, since those are the chronological and uh, most favorite books of people who enjoy Narnia. And then definitely make sure to get to the Silver Chair at some point. It was actually tons of people when I mentioned this as a book club pick, we're talking about how this is actually their favorite or at least their second favorite Narnian book. So it's well beloved. If you're curious about my book club, definitely email me at christylewisreviews at gmail.com, which I will have down below for you because we are reading short classics every month and the goal is really just to generate some giving to charities. So we'll probably become a Patreon club at some point so that I can just donate the proceeds through Patreon to um, Families Together, which is the charity that all of my proceeds from this channel go to. So definitely email me if you're interested in joining our short classics club. We meet monthly on Zoom. All right, guys, I will talk to you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.